Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our theme is listening to God and in this series we discover how we can listen to God. We call this the prophetic process. I'm not suggesting that every believer is now a prophet, but I am saying that the Holy Spirit, the spirit of prophecy, lives on the inside of us and He will give us a revelation concerning God's will, will be led and guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. So in this prophetic process of listening to God today, we know that it begins with receiving a revelation from God, a word from God. But we must be careful because that word needs to be interpreted correctly. So we receive the revelation and then learn how to act on it. And so, you see, in listening to God, you've received the revelation, but if you go out on that revelation as you've received it, you can make a mistake. I could have said, there's somebody here by the name of Nostra. Where are you? And they would have said, what is he talking about? But because I waited for the right understanding of what God was saying, the interpretation of what God, what God was saying, because revelation does not always come to you in explicitly verbal form. Sometimes you'll see a picture. Uh, sometimes you will, you will get a thought or a word or an impression. And you've got to say, what does this mean? You have a dream. You don't understand the meaning of it. The interpretation must follow. So if you, if you move out on a revelation only, you can do it prematurely and you can abort the whole prophetic process. That's why you must give it time and you must think about it. And if there is a word that's coming and you put it like this and you say, this is what God has shown me, people can join together who are prophetically minded and pray and to say, let's see what God is saying to us through this revelation. But even then when you've got that, you haven't finished because you must move into the application. Because just to say that you know what God is saying, you have the correct interpretation, it doesn't mean to say that you're ready to go out and prophesy and, and to deliver this word, because what's the application? It might be that God says, the application is you get home and you pray about this, you don't say anything to anybody. Or the application could be that the leaders of the church need to consider this and then decide what to do about it. In Acts chapter 11, we heard about Agapus. Agapus, the, the prophet, he came down from Jerusalem and they prophesied that there was going to be a famine in Judea. And so they said, all right, what should we do about this? That was the application. And, then, and the, the prophets were part of that process. They didn't just say, oh, well, God has told us. Why has he told us this? Oh, well, let's just go and prophesy it. There was a reason for it. And they had to think about what that application was. So we must lis listen actively to God to learn from Him how to handle His rhema word, that who we should give it to, how we should pass it on, what we're to do with it. But we haven't finished even then, my friends. See, this process goes on. We must be thorough. We need to get to grips with the motivation of all of this. And you can still get into error if you approach this revelation that God has given you, although you've listened, you've heard, God has given His revelation, you've got the interpretation of it, you even have the application, but if you do it in the wrong motivation, you're going to get into trouble. That's where the enemy can creep in. Now, I want to tell you this motivation goes two ways. It's a two-edged sword. You've got to make sure that the people to whom you are prophesying and the person to whom you are prophesying is in the right place to receive this word and their motivation is not, not incorrect. Because at times, if people come with a fleshly, selfish motivation, looking for something sensational or, or, or looking for something idolatrous in their own life, it can lead to a wrong manifestation of prophecy. It can lead to a false prophecy. And that's happened on many, many occasions. 
because people aren't pure in their motives. If the person who is giving the prophecy has got a motive of say, look at me, look how clever I am, I am such a great important prophet, look how much I know, then it's, he's opening himself up or she's opening herself up to a false prophecy or to deliver something false because God will not bless that wrong motivation. It is opening and exposing you up to the enemy. Or if you are saying, look, I'm going to prophesy, and this gift that I have, I'm going to use it for my own means, for financial means, or for, to draw attention to myself, or to bring me to a place of prominence, finally to launch me into my ministry, or something like that, then you're going to, it's going to be a something sour is going to be introduced here, and it won't prosper, it won't benefit, it won't be right. But still, even then, you're not finished when your motivation's right. There must come a testing. Every word must be offered for testing, for judging, for weighing, for sifting. Nobody should ever insist that their word must be received or obeyed without any form of testing. And this is one of the ways, and sometimes it's immaturity, but other times it's just rebellion and a mark of a false prophet. So when people come and say, this is the word of the Lord, it's been tested, you don't have to test it. Friends, that's not right. You are responsible for testing everything that people say to you. And some, of, some Christians, some believers are so silly when it comes to this business, they don't test anything, they just take everything, and because some so-called prophet says it, they believe it and do it. And the fact is, even if the prophet is absolutely right on every other occasion, it doesn't mean to say the prophet is going to be right on this occasion. You have to test everything, and you are responsible for doing that. And we shall see how to do that in a future session. But even then, you're not finished. The process continues because you have to say, how must this word be delivered? It must be given in God's way, in His timing, with God's grace, in His order, and with His authority. And so often in our church in Kensington Temple, London City Church, where we have very large congregations, we do not allow anybody just to walk up and take the microphone and prophesy. If they have a prophetic word, they come to the front of the church, share it with one of the leaders, and very often it's the leaders who deliver it. And that soon shows you where you're coming from. But if you say, no, I've got to give this word. God gave it to me. I have the anointing to give it. Well, friends, if you're not willing to submit on that level, sometimes it can mean that you are wanting to draw attention to yourself and that your motivation is wrong. And so often, it's helpful for the leaders to say, we've had several prophetic words, and to generalize what those words were, and to minister into the church in that way. I'm not saying it's wrong for the person who gets the prophecy to deliver it. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm saying that we must wait on the Lord as to ask, who should deliver it? Who should give this word? How should it be given? And where should it be given? And so forth. And so we say, are we there yet? No, not quite. Not quite. Because the whole purpose of this must be seen. Why is God giving this prophecy? What is the practical result? What's the practical point? What action must be taken? And so that is all part of the delivering of the prophetic word. So can you see? It is a process. That, and we must go through this process. Now, if you think it's sounding very complicated, actually it's not. It's not complicated. It's the process that we'll all go through if we are seriously wanting to move in genuine prophetic manifestation. And we will submit ourselves to this. And we will allow the Holy Spirit to use us in this way. And so, we know that when this prophetic word comes, it is worth it. It's worth going through that process because when it is a good, right word from God, it's powerful. It will reveal the hidden secrets of people's hearts. They will say, God is amongst you. It will reveal the things that the Holy Spirit wants to say to the body of Christ. It will reveal the power of God and words will bring forth the anointing of God and the power of God because God's word does not return to him void. That's the power of prophetic words. I have seen whole, whole, Meetings turned around by a prophetic word. I have seen lives revolutionized by a prophetic word. I have seen nations turned around by prophetic words. I have seen it with my own eyes. And maybe I'll share one or two instances as we go on in the teaching. So let's be convinced about the existence of authentic prophetic utterances and let's be committed to seek God and have the discipline in seeking God all the way through this process so that we are moving in this prophetic anointing. Now, one thing, something else I want to point out 
about the gift of prophecy and the prophetic manifestation is that it involves God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There is a Trinitarian foundation to every manifestation of the Spirit. These gifts come from God, they come from the Lord Jesus Christ under His authority, and they come from the Holy Spirit. The Father initiates the Word. He's the communicating God who speaks to make Himself known, to bring life and salvation to the whole world. The Son Himself is the personal Word. He is the full eternal revelation of God's holy name and nature. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit of revelation. He's inspired the written word so that it is full, complete, and sufficient, and infallible as a, as a record of what God has communicated to us. The Holy Spirit witnesses directly to our spirits, testifying to Jesus, speaking to us through the prophetic word. And so we see that as we move in the prophetic anointing, we are being involved in God the Father's work, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's a strong biblical base for this, a strong Trinitarian base. Therefore, we should expect to know the Father better through prophecy, to know the Son better, and to know the Holy Spirit. But there is also a strong scriptural foundation. We mustn't forget the scriptural foundation. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, we see where it says, all Scripture is God-breathed. That makes it plain that God is still breathing His Scripture. In other words, this is not some dead, dusty, closed word. This word is living. It's still carrying the breath of God. God is continuing to speak His word as it's recorded in Scripture. It is, this is a living word. And so God, therefore, through his word, the scripture, is speaking into our personal lives and into our congregational lives. And so we're not throwing away the Bible when we're prophesying. In fact, we can say all prophetic utterances flow out of this book. They flow out of the living word of God. How? Let me show you. First of all, prophecy can be used by the Lord to illuminate our understanding of scriptures to illuminate the truth of the Word of God. Let me tell you a story. Uh, a young woman whom I was counseling had great difficulty in recognizing that God loved her. And so I saw, said, Lord, reveal your love to her. And God gave her a prophetic car accident. You say, well, isn't that weird? We thought it was weird, but let me tell you the whole story. She left that place where she was counseling with me, and she drove in her car, and she had a terrible car accident. And she got out of the car, walked completely whole, not one scratch on her. And a policeman said, I don't know how you got out of that car alive, let alone unhurt. Somebody up there must love you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, let, I, I want to get the story correct. I think the exact words, someone up there must be looking after you or something like that. But what hap whatever the exact words were, that's how she heard it. God loves me. Now, what is that? The Bible says it, chapter and verse. We can find it. God is love. God loves you. But when the Spirit takes that and prophetically illuminates the Scripture, you have an example, prophetic example. It may not be a dramatic event like that. It may just be a word which corresponds with this word and illuminates. The Holy Spirit will also confirm the witness of the Scriptures through the inner witness of the Spirit. How do we know the Bible is the Word of God? We can prove its, prove its authenticity by studying archaeology, by studying theology, by looking at all these things. But at the end of the day, we know the Bible is the Word of God the same way we know that we are saved because the Spirit witnesses to us. When we read the Scriptures, we know it's God speaking to us. So He will confirm it through this kind of inner witness of the Spirit. Also, he will confirm it through signs and wonders following. And I want to correlate this with what I said earlier, that we cannot expect God to confirm his written word to us if it is clear in his word and we refuse to believe it. In other words, if we, if we say, oh, we, the Bible says adultery is wrong, but I'm going to check this out. I want a sign to show me that this is wrong. That is presumption. 
We have no right to presume that God will confirm his word in any way if it's clearly written to us in scripture. But on the other hand, God will confirm his, the word of his gospel through signs and wonders. He will also give us by his grace many, many indications that the will of God in the scriptures is correct because it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we're not to be conformed to the image of this world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that you may know what is good, God's, God, God's good and perfect and acceptable is, that you may be able to prove it so that when you take God's word, believe it and act upon it, then he will confirm it to you. But it's not like saying, I'm not going to believe it until you confirm it. And if God ever does that, he does it by grace and does it by mercy. And it has happened. I, I know it's happened particularly for unbelievers. But if you are a believer, I don't think you can play with God in this way. Uh, although God is so very gracious. I remember the story many years ago when I was witnessing to people here. Uh, and we were going out on the streets. And there was a man who was an atheist. He came in from the streets in our coffee bar meeting. And he was an atheist. Oh, he was a tough nut. He knew everything. He tied us in knots. And at the end of the day, we simply simply said to him, listen, pray this prayer with us. What prayer? Just don't worry. God, God, if you exist, if you exist and you don't, he said, we didn't say that, he said that, show yourself to me. And then he left. And he went out, crossed the road, nothing happened, turned the corner, no lights, no angels, no earthquakes, dismissed it, ah, nothing to it. When he got home to his flat, my friend, he took out his keys and he put them in the lock. And as he put them in the lock, he began to tremble all over his body as the living God revealed himself to this atheist. He went straight upstairs and gave his life to Jesus Christ, came back next week and testified about it. Oh yes, God confirmed to him. God does confirm his word, but that's a prophetic function. So God, through prophetic ministry, can confirm the word, the scriptures, and can confirm the word that he's spoken to you in your heart. So, we see also that the Holy Spirit, through prophecy, can illustrate, not just illuminate and help you to understand the word, but illustrate the word and give you examples of the word in your life. That's a clear function of prophecy, an illustration of the truth of God's word through a prophetic utterance. And let me give you an example of this. Somebody may say, I, I, I see the picture. I see a picture of a little girl of the age of six and, 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 and you fell down and you, you grazed your knee and I see the picture of Jesus coming and just wrapping his arms around you. What's that? There's a picture of the loving, tender-hearted, tender kindness of God in the way he deals with his children. And it might even carry a word of knowledge concerning somebody's, an event that took place when somebody was at that age and so forth. But it's an illustration, but you can see it's an illustration of the word. It's coming from the book. Then the Holy Spirit can use prophecy to apply to believers the particular specific promise or relevance of a verse or a passage to everyone who will hear and accept it. So this is the function of prophecy. It does not do away with God's book, but it illustrates, it illuminates it, it applies it, it confirms it, and so forth. So, we know then that we must approach prophecy in a very balanced way. We don't say it's everything and chuck out everything else. We don't say prophecy is nothing and ignore it. We acknowledge that prophecy is something and we put it in its rightful place in our lives and follow the Holy Spirit at all times. Therefore, of course, we must acknowledge that no prophecy should be acted on hastily, unwisely. It should all be tested. And uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5, it summarizes this whole process. And we're going to come back to it and we're going to expand on it at another, another time. But right now, let's just recognize that the Bible says, do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast to what is good. So that's the correct biblical prophecy, the, the biblical balance of prophecy. So, when we draw all these spiritual principles together, we understand that there are three main ways that prophecy is relevant to us today. 
three main ways. And we've been building up to this over the last few sessions, but we're going to see how it applies to us. First of all, there is the prophetic role. That belongs to every believer who is called to listen to God and to live prophetically, both individually and together in the church as the body of Christ. This is the prophethood of all believers. And since Pentecost, it belongs to us, this prophethood, because the Spirit of God has come into our lives. Have a look at 1 John 2 and verse 27. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. What is this saying? It's saying we have an anointing that teaches us. What's the goal of prophecy? The knowledge of God. This anointing teaches us about all things and we know him who is true. So this is the prophetic role that God gives to us by the Holy Spirit. When we come to Christ and we put our faith and trust in him, the Holy Spirit comes to bring prophetic revelation that we might grow in the knowledge of the Lord. In the Old Testament, not everybody had this knowledge because the Holy Spirit was only given to prophets and a few kings and to priests and at their anointing. But in the New Testament, this anointing is given to all believers. And so we all can know him, from the least to the greatest. And we don't have to say to somebody else, come, let me show you to know the Lord. We know him directly and personally. We can encourage one another in our relationship with Jesus, but we don't depend on somebody else for our knowledge of God. We know him for ourselves. We don't know Jesus secondhand. We know him firsthand by the Holy Spirit. And that is one of the distinguishing marks of the new covenant, the presence of God's Spirit amongst all believers so that all under the new covenant have that direct personal experience of Jesus. That's prophetic. And we read about this in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 to 11 quoting from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. So this is the prophetic role that belongs to us all as believers. We've also seen how this relates to witnessing to Jesus and witnessing and speaking for him and testifying for him. Everybody's called in that respect to this prophetic role. Then we see another level. This is the prophetic gift. Every believer may, from time to time, be inspired by the Spirit to give a prophetic message, but the manifestation of the gift of prophecy takes the form of a specific word that will come on a specific occasion to bring edification, exhortation, or comfort. Or it can operate, it can operate congregationally where the Spirit manifests this gift and it can be manifested through any believer who, who is walking in the Spirit, any believer who is anointed by God. And so, whether in public ministry, or private conversation, or in church meetings, public worship, God can bring this into your life as a believer. So you all have the calling of, of a prophet by virtue of being a Christian, by virtue of being a believer, because of the prophethood of all believers. This is a role that you all are called to fulfill. It is also a spiritual gift that can be manifested in your life as the Holy Spirit manifests it and chooses to do it. And we should be open to the Holy Spirit like that. But then, thirdly, there is a higher level. This is the prophetic ministry. And these are particular men and women who are recognized as prophets. The prophetic gift is particularly developed among, in them. And the prophetic call is, is particularly strong upon them. In fact, it is a life calling. You can describe them by this gift. They are apostles or prophets or evangelists or pastors or teachers. This is the call of God upon them. Now, that doesn't mean to say 
that every believer is either an apostle or prophet or an evangelist or so forth? No, because these are leadership functions that God gives to certain people so that they can prepare the rest of the body of Christ for the work of the ministry. It's to enable the body. And neither is it that we should suggest that you can either be an apostle or a prophet or a Bible teacher, or a Bible teacher can't be an evangelist or a pastor. No, no, no. There's a, you can have a mixture of these gifts. The last two in the list, prophet teachers, often go, uh, sorry, pastor teacher, those two gifts often go together. Uh, and in fact, some people think they're one and the same gift. I don't. I think that there's a distinction. You can be a pastor without being a thoroughgoing teacher. You can be a teacher without being a thoroughgoing pastor, though every pastor must be able to teach. And every teacher should have a kind of a pastoral heart, otherwise you're in trouble there. But anyway, the point is this. You can have a prophetic dimension to your ministry, as well as an apostolic one. You can have an evangelistic, as well as a pastoral one, or those, those two gifts don't often exist happily in the same person, because they are so different. And, uh, and the marvelous thing is about these, gift, these uh, gift mixers, is that they can be such a blessing. You can be moving in very, very significant Bible teaching, and you can have your eyebrows knitted together in typical didactic fashion, and everybody could be furiously writing notes, and suddenly the Holy Spirit can come and say, Colin, Mr. Bible teacher, please move out because here comes the Holy Ghost. Here comes the prophetic anointing. And that happens to me from time to time and it's very surprising. And, uh, or at times something can happen and an evangelistic anointing can come. Some people complain when they invite me to speak. They say, we don't know who we are inviting. We're inviting Colin the prophet, Colin the Bible teacher, Colin of this or Colin of that. I say, you just got me, and the rest is the Holy Ghost. You take it as it comes. So we're not being too rigid about these distinctions. But there is a special call of God upon the lives of individual people, whoever they are, male or female, whom the Holy Spirit is equipped with the gift of prophecy and the ministry of prophecy has come from the person of the Lord Jesus Christ so that together they can begin to uh, function in the body of Christ according to that ministry, according to that gift. So the prophetic role, the prophetic gift, and the prophetic ministry. We're going to come back to each of those three manifestations of the prophetic in the next session and we're going to go deeper into each one of, one of these. So God bless you until we come back to the next time. And that brings to an end today's program on prophetic listening. And I pray that God has begun to minister to you and help you understand how you can hear from God for yourself and how you can put what he says into practice. We'll be back next time with more on prophetic listening. God bless you.